I appear before you today in the honor and the glory of the Lord God Almighty only. And today will be the first in a series of biographies of Jewish people who came to the knowledge of Yeshua as their Savior and their Messiah. In this time period we live in, many Jewish people are being saved to the glory of the eternal God and praise be his name forever and ever. The first in this series of Jewish people who have come to know Yeshua as their savior is a rabbi from Hungary. He was born in the year 1830 and his name was Yitzhak Isaac Lichtenstein. And there will be three parts to his testimony. I will Americanize the names of the towns in Hungary to make them easier for the American mind to absorb. After our music and worship, then I will come back. I was going to come back dressed in a beard, but I have the beard, but I don't have the black hat. So if you happen to see any motorcyclists going by, let me know. I'll stop them and get a black hat. But I wasn't able to get one. So we'll go on with the rest of the service and then we'll go into the life of Yitzhak Lichtenstein. This whole week, I have been uh, under pressure about this. Uh, what right do I have to talk about people who have given their life to our Savior and Messiah? Uh, why should I repeat their testimony? And why start with Yitzhak Lichtenstein? You know, this is unbelievable because I said I should wear a beard, but I don't have a beard, but Rosetta found a beard for me. And then I said, well, what good's a beard without a black hat? So, I've just been told that there's a black hat for me. So, I'm going to uh, tell you the same words my daughter said to everyone at her wedding when I forgot the ring and I left it in the car. So we had to get the car, stop the service and get the car. And her words to everyone was, talk among yourselves. Mishpoka, <laughs> I bid you a good Shabbos for today. My name is Yitzhak Lichtenstein, and I became a rabbi when I was 19 years old. I officiate for several communities in northern Hungary. And I finally settled in Topio Zeal. I remained at my post for nearly 40 years, serving my people honorably and with much vigor and strength. I was rabbi over our district and wrote a newspaper to encourage our people. One day a teacher in one of my schools brought me a Bible. Okay, I look. 
as I started to look through the pages, I saw the word Jesu Christi. I took this Bible and I threw it against my bookshelf in the back of the room. I strongly rebuked him for having such a book in a school in my district or even on his own person. The book had hit the wall and back and fallen in among other books and I couldn't find it. But sometime after that, there was a strange occurrence that happened, and it didn't usually happen in our area. And that occurrence was the anti-Semitic blood libels. And 12 Jewish men and a Jewish woman were thrown into prison under the pretext that they had captured a Christian girl, killed her, and used her blood for purposes and services. And that started everything in my life moving forward. So let's pray. O Lord our God, King of creation, King of kings and Lord of lords, glory to you. O Lord God, you sit in your pristine kingdom and there is no sin in it. And you sent your Son into this world so that all who come to him as their savior and kinsman redeemer would have everlasting life with you in your kingdom. We thank you that you have provided such a place, O oh God. We thank you that you have supplied such a place for all people who will come to your son to be with you forever and ever. And Lord God, we don't understand forever and ever because we die, our parents die, our children will die. But one day we know, oh Lord God, you have control of everything. And we know that to those who are reborn of the spirit, you will bring us home. thank you for the saving grace of Messiah Yeshua. We thank you for the saving grace you have given to all people who are here who believe in you. And we pray, O oh Lord God, that you strengthen us in our walk and our pathway and that you lead us in paths of righteousness for your own name's sake. And Lord God, as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, make us strong so that we fear no evil. And make us so that we will yield to your rod and willingly be lifted by your staff and that it will comfort us because we will dwell in your kingdom forever and ever. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. These blood libels had gone on for hundreds of years all through Europe. There was always one ploy or another. The anti-Semites were always there and very strong. I gave this subject a lot of thought. Even though these 
accusations were eventually proven to be false, they kept coming up time after time after time. I thought there has to be something in this book that they call the New Testament that points people to hate Jewish people. There has to be something in that book. While I was browsing my library, don't you know this German Bible that I had thrown back there 30 years before, all of a sudden fell out. I know, I know, I know you say I should have better control over my library. I should dust the books more often. Nevertheless, I didn't. And all of a sudden, there is that German Bible. I picked it up, I dusted it off, I examined it carefully. And I read it. And after some time of study, I put my thoughts in a publication called The Mirror. And this was something I produced for all the different congregations and schools in my districts. Verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 29 starts with the words, Much they have afflicted me from my youth up. I wrote in the mirror that there was no long explanation that was needed to show in these few words that the psalmist summed up the bitter experiences and sorrows that we, as the sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, have suffered from our youth at the hands of the Gentiles around us. You know, the impressions that one has in a young life take hold on them. And in my later years, I had no cause to change the impressions I grew up with. It's no wonder that I came to think that Christ himself was the plague and the cause of the problems for our people, the cause of our sorrows, the cause of our persecutions. And in this conviction, I grew into manhood. And still cherishing it, I became older. <laughs> now, I never knew any difference between nominal Christianity or any other kind of Christianity. And I certainly didn't know anything about the fountainhead of Christianity himself. Strangely enough, in the last <coughs> horrible blood libel, where the people were exonerated and still other people were complaining that they were exonerated, I thought about the New Testament over and over again. The cry, death to the Jew, death to the Jew, was re-echoed, re-echoed over and over again. The frenzy was excessive, and the ringleaders used the name of Christ as a cloak to cover their own abominable deeds, which were as bad, if not worse, than what these twelve were accused of. Only they did it against the Jews, so it was all right. The wicked practices of these men wearing the name of Christ only to further their evil design arouse some indignation in true Christians. Notably among them was Professor Franz Delisch, who taught at Leipzig University. And with his pen on fire and his warning voice, he denounced the lying rage of the anti-Semites. Bravo! Will anybody say bravo? And bravo again. Part two in my life. The gospel is 
it's made real. I notice in some of these passages that the people who love Jesus quoted Messiah was talked about as the one who brings joy to men. We didn't have any joy. He was called the Prince of Peace, the Redeemer. His gospel was extolled as a message of love and life to all people. I wrote in the mirror, I could scarcely believe the words that I read in this little Bible. Our people have suffered for centuries at the hands of those who said they were Christians. This was a conundrum to me. How could it be true? So I must summarize. One day, I was rearranging my books. I was surprised. I scarcely trusted my eyes when I found a Bible I had thrown back on the wall some 30 years before. It was in a corner hidden amongst the other books. I opened the book, I looked over its pages, and I read. How can I possibly express to you the impression which I first received? During this past series of blood libels, not the half had been told to me of the greatness and the power of this book. It had always been a sealed book to me because it's a sin for anybody to read that book who's Jewish. Now everything, after reading it, seemed new to me. It was like the, the sight of an old friend who's taken a long walk and he is dusty and he comes in and he takes off the clothes and you give him new garments and he's in a festive garment festive mood is like a bridegroom getting ready to be married, all dressed up, all beautiful. It's like a bride adorned with all of her jewels. It was new, it was life, it was vibrant. And I kept these convictions locked within my own heart for a number of years. During this time, however, when I was preaching at our services, I began to preach what was thought to be strange new ideas. These ideas astonished my congregation and the other congregations in my district. One Shabbos, I could contain myself no longer and I preached from the parable of the whited sepulcher. I openly admitted that the subject was taken from the New Testament, and I acknowledge Yeshua as Mashiach, Amen. the only Redeemer of Israel. <clears throat> well, you can only imagine what hit the fan. It came from every direction and all angles, from above, from below. The line had been drawn in the sand, and there was no turning back. Yeshua is Mashiach. Amen. Part three, my new life in Messiah. Immediately, immediately I put my thoughts into three publications that came out one right after the other. They created a sensation among the Jewish people. Sensation is a mild word. They created a great tumult among the Jewish people who read it. But not only in Hungary, it was sent throughout all of Europe. It's no wonder that my actions raised such a tumult. I was a highly respected and venerated elder rabbi who was still in office. I still had my congregation. And now I was calling for my congregations and the other congregations in my district to come under the banner of Yeshua of Nazareth and hail him as their true Messiah. 
Well, as soon as this happened, the Jewish officials in the capital raised a storm of protest. And quite truthfully, I expected nothing else. In just a few weeks, I had gone from one of their noblest leaders to a person in disgrace. The charge was made that I sold myself to the missionaries. Some people even said I never wrote these pamphlets that came out. I just signed my name to them. It was then that I was ordered to appear before the chief rabbinic in Budapest. Well, I went to Budapest and I came to the hall. And as soon as I entered the hall, I heard these words, retract, retract. My answer was short and my answer was sweet. I said, gentlemen, I will most willingly retract my statements. If you can convince me that I am wrong. Well, the chief rabbi Cohen had a compromise. He said, you know, you can believe just what you like, but you cannot preach Jesus as Messiah in your congregation or any place else. As far as the, the pamphlets go and the newspaper you sent out, don't worry about it because the conference of rabbis will draw up a document stating that you were temporarily insane when you wrote them, but you're okay now. <laughs> I answered them calmly but indignantly. I said that that would be a strange proposal for me to, to yield to since this is the only time in my whole life that I have been truly in my correct mind. They demanded that I resign, that I be baptized. I replied that I have no intention of joining any church. I said to them, I have found in the New Testament the true Judaism. I will go home and remain with my own congregation. And I did just that. And I preached throughout my districts, and I preached throughout Europe the glory of the New Testament. But there was a lot of pressure brought on the people in my own community. The outside influences wanted them to dismiss me as a rabbi. Many in my own congregation, including relatives of my wife, suffered ruin and loss of trade because they clung to my teachings and therefore other people would not shop at their establishment anymore. It was at that time that I became well known by various church and missionary societies that I had not known before or had not known me before. No one spoke to me about Jesus. The Lord himself spoke to me through his word, through the book, through this New Testament. But I was becoming well known, supposedly. The papacy learned of my existence, and they sent a special emissary to come to me. He entreated me to come into the service of the Pope. I was not tempted by their offer. I said I will remain among my own people. For I love Yeshua, who is my Messiah. I believe in the New Testament, but I am not drawn to join any church of Christian. I decided to follow the example of the prophet Jeremiah after the destruction of Jerusalem. He chose to remain and to lament among the ruins of the holy city with a remnant of his brethren. He wanted to act as a watchman for
from within. And I decided also that I would be a watchman from within and warn the people in my district and plead with them, believe in Yeshua, the true glory of Israel, avoid the wrath to come. In later years, I resigned my office as rabbi. The trials and the sorrows of my life had taken a very heavy toll upon me. I settled in Budapest, where I found, to my surprise, a ready platform for my ideas. The opposition against me was relentless. I was physically attacked in the street. My barber was bribed to mess up my beard and disfigure it. See, it's not the same. He, he cut it, caca. <laughs> <laughs> my landlord was paid to report all the people that came to visit me. Instead of the rabbinic authorities' opposition to my ideas causing people to stay away from me, it accomplished just the opposite. Many people came to visit me to discuss my ideas and the New Testament. I wrote the following letter to my dear friend David Barron, who was a strong Jewish believer in London. He had been brought up Orthodox in Russia and went to London and he was transformed by the glory of God. I wrote to him. Wisdom cries without and causes her voice to be heard in the street. And I wrote that to him because now doctors, professors, and many people of authority and influence were coming to my house. Families of position were visiting me and condemning the harsh conduct of the rabbinic toward me. Quite often, I have had both grave and important discussions with Talmudists and other rabbis who wish to bring me to a compromise. It's worthy to know that many people who came to talk to me and had no knowledge of the New Testament, after our discussions, asked me for a copy of the book which was supposedly a sin for them to have. For over 20 years, I witnessed in many parts of the continent. I told everyone the truth I saw in Messiah Yeshua. As times passed, the storms of controversy, misunderstanding, and antagonism <coughs> began to tell on me. But my spirit remain undaunted. About this time, I wrote and advertised the following in the newspapers. <clears throat> dear brethren, dear Jewish brethren, I have been young and now I'm old. I have attained the age of 80 years, which the psalmist speaks of as the utmost period of human life on earth. When others my age are joyfully reaping the fruits of their labors, I am alone with my wife, forsaken, because I have lifted up my voice in warning my brethren of the wrath to come. Hosea 14, verse 2 and 3 says, Return, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast stumbled in thine iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. It's clear. It's clear. I was an honored rabbi for 40 years, and now in my old age, many treat me as someone who is possessed by an evil spirit. I'm set upon as an outcast. I've become the joke of mockers who point their fingers at me. 
But while I live, I will stand on my watchtower, even though I may be standing there alone. I will listen to the words of the Lord God and look for the time when he shall return to Zion in mercy. There will be one day a time when Israel shall fill the world with a joyous cry, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. One day, quite unexpectedly, I became sick and lingered only a short time. I realized the end was coming, and I said the following in the presence of both my wife and my nurse. Give my warmest thanks and greetings to my brethren and my friends. Good night, my children. Also, good night, my enemies. Keep my injury no more, for I go home to be with my Lord. We have one God and one Father of us all. We also have one Messiah, Yeshua the Righteous One, who gave his life for the salvation of men. O Lord, my God, unto thy hands I commend my spirit. Amen. Now postscript. On Friday morning, October 16, 1909, the aged rabbi Yitzhak Lichtenstein entered into the presence of his Lord. His spirit of love and forgiveness was beautiful, while the spirit of his enemies was bitter. The following day, there was an article full of falsehoods written in the Orthodox Jewish newspaper. The paper tried to discredit Rabbi Lichtenstein's testimony in the eyes of Jewry. The following is a literal translation from the Yiddish. Caption said, Death of a Missionary. Yesterday, the former rabbi of Tapio Zio, I. Lichtenstein, may his name be blotted out, was buried here. While still a rabbi, he was in the service of the soul and trapping missionary. From the Jewish pulpit, he proclaimed the foundational doctrines of Christianity and wrote a pamphlet in which he invited Jews to recognize the founder of the Christian religion. Since the time the old apostate I. Lichtenstein left his congregation, he has lived in Budapest. He has lived on money supplied to him by English missionary societies. This is because he lent his name to missionary purposes. He was not formally baptized. So therefore, this deceiver and this misleader is actually buried in the cemetery of the Reformed Synagogue in Budapest. His name and the name of the wicked shall rot. <coughs> so I have just decided to go through. You know that we as believers are assured that the names of the wicked as well as the names of liars and slanders will not be in the Messiah's book of life. By the way, I know of Rabbi Isaac Lichtenstein, <coughs> and now you know of him. Does anyone know the name of the editor of the paper? <laughs> No, he doesn't live on. For the conclusion of this first person testimony, I thought I would read some excerpts from letters written by Rabbi Lichtenstein. He wrote, By his divine presence, the presence of the Lord God, I accidentally took in my hand a New Testament which for many long years I left unnoticed in the corner of my bookshelf. From every line, from every word, the Jewish spirit streamed forth. Life, life, power, endurance, faith, hope, love, and chastity. Limitless, indestructible faith in God. Kindness to family, moderation to self-denial, contentment to the exclusion of all 
sense of need. Unbelievable. Pity, gentleness, consideration for others with extreme strictness in regards to oneself. All of these are to be found pervading this book. Every noble principle, every pure moral teaching, patriarchal virtues, which when Israel was adorned in its prime, were marvelous. Israel, to some extent, is still adorned as God's beloved. But I found in this book of books all these things refined and simplified. In this book, there is a balm for every pain of the soul, comfort for every sorrow, healing for every moral hurt, renewal of faith, and the resurrection of a new life, well pleasing to the Lord God. He continues to write different papers. I thought that the New Testament was impure, a source of pride, overwhelming selfishness, of hatred, and violence of the worst kind. But as I opened it, I felt myself wonderfully drawn to take possession of it. A sudden glory or light flashed into my soul. I looked for thorns, and I gathered roses. I discovered pearls instead of pebbles. Instead of hatred, I found love. Instead of bondage, I found freedom. Instead of pride, I found humility. Instead of enmity, conciliation. Instead of death, I found life, salvation, resurrection, and a heavenly treasure. And why do those people who say they love this book openly hate the Jewish people. <coughs> Irrespective, the Jewish people have been sick for almost 2,000 years. They have sought healing, but they have not found it. This true healing only comes from the one that can heal all things, and that is Yeshua, who is Messiah. <coughs> It can only be received by contact with Yeshua and by the power that goes forth from him <coughs> and from his spirit can anyone find healing. The former rabbi said, I will come to Yeshua in his heavenly glory, in his divinely exalted and great eternity, for he is the Redeemer, the Messiah, Prince of Peace. So now let me ask you a question. Is that what you think about Yeshua, Jesus? Do you think that he is the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of all those who will come to him anywhere, any place, or any time? you think that he is the Prince of Peace or not? Is the thought of him vibrant and fresh in your mind? Can you say that in spite of all things that happen to you, that he is your all and all? I don't mean your husband or your wife or your children or your father. I mean is he all <coughs> number one. If you can't say that, please come up and see me. For the Lord God reigns, he always has reigned, and he always will reign. All honor and glory belongs to the Lord God Almighty. Now going to have prayer.